It's a long journey. It's been uh, epic. Wait, is, is this a dream? I'll ask the questions. <sighs> Hungerford is a story about a group of teenagers whose lives get turned upside down when their hometown is taken over by sinister forces. So for several years, I had been working on um, my own YouTube videos and a talent incubation company named uh, Wild Seed Studios uh, discovered my work and thought, God, this guy would be cool to work with, I think, <laughs> um, from what I've been told, the stories. So with Jesse Cleverly, the creative director of Wildsy Studios, uh, we co-wrote together Hungerford over the course of about six to eight months. Since I was about 13, I had been interested in visual effects. So I spent kind of the next four or five years deliberately trying to better my scale and scope of my videos from um, replicating scenes from War of the Worlds to my own Harry Potter inspired video and continuously at the same time trying to better my storytelling with the camera. And it got to the point with Hungerford where it was like, this is the perfect opportunity for me to, to imply my skills as a visual effects artist and director to also telling a story with, with the camera and telling a full, a full frontal story with, with arcs and you know. For me, it's about the story. And at the same time, it's about telling that story visually, whether the story is 50 seconds long or whether it's 90 minutes long. You know, what attracts me to making things is, is the story and the characters, essentially. And if I connect in, in some kind of way with the story or the characters, or both, hopefully, then I think about, OK, so visually, how would I tell this story? I am, I'm completely self-taught um, from uh, the camera, to the visual effects, to my directing abilities. Uh, no one has ever taught me how to do it. I, I've spent the past five, six years of my life intensively learning off, you know, in my own time. Robert Rodriguez, for me, was a, a gigantic inspiration because he, he convinced me that you don't need to go to film school. You, you don't even need somebody to teach you. If you can buy a camera, which nowadays anybody can do, you can learn. Um, and it's, it's more about having the, the balls, as it were, to just go out there and shoot and be, be welcome to, to discovery. Nothing's ever negative. It's more about learning and the, the discovery of the process. I try, to, I try to give myself a goal, which is with any movie that I ever watch, whether it's shit or whether it's the best film I've ever seen, is learn something from it. Because I believe if you want to be a filmmaker, which I, I do consider myself to be, the best way to learn is to watch others and how they've done it. So if I watch a Spielberg film, I intensively analyse, okay, so why is he, why has he moved the camera that way? Why is he revealing somebody like this? Why has he cut to that instead of that? And I think that for any filmmakers, I think you've got, you know, people can, can, can go to lectures to learn or people can read a textbook. Filmmakers, you have got millions of films that you can pour over with, with information there ready to be learned if you've got your, your mind open and your eye open enough to, to, to learn that information, I guess. Um, and it's the same with, with YouTube videos and Vimeo. People like Ryan Connolly. I've been a fan of Film Riot since I think it's the third episode. I've, I've watched them kind of in the same way I have grow from, okay, this is how you make a squib. Um, out of an air compressed, you know, garden hose to them making insanely good short films on C300 and a RED. It's just amazing. And there is a whole world of filmmakers out there that you can tap into now, which is just unbelievable. I remember my old drama teacher, he was phenomenal, a man called uh, Ian McShane. And he was just the most eccentric man I think I've ever met. I mean, he didn't teach us anything about drama, but taught me a lot about 
film, I guess. And he basically said, have you seen Robert Rodriguez's 10 Minute Film School? And I said, no, what are you talking about? And he basically said, oh my God, you, you just need to go watch them. So I think in like one night, I just poured through all of them and they're 10 minute kind of shorts that he makes on the set of every film. But breaking down the barriers of, listen, you don't need money for this. This is how I approached it with no money. And truly, man, it gave me so much inspiration for, oh my God, he is going and making massive Hollywood pictures and he's just being inventive and intuitive about it. And he, 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 there's a great expression from him where he says, we didn't have the option to, to kind of get rid of the problem with the money hose. And I think so many filmmakers think that, oh my God, we've got this problem and the only way we can get rid of it is with money. And it's so not true. You just have to think about it. You have to truly think, okay, let's work on our toes. Let's think about it and let's find a better alternative. And I have a little, a bit of a motto, I guess, which is have a pliable idea. Have an idea that you're happy with, that you think is, is your best possible idea, but also be, be available enough and be open-minded enough to, on the spot, be able to, to change it. And that's why I say pliable, because you've got this thing, but if it's better if you shape it over here, then do that. Um, another filmmaker, which for me is just, I mean, he, he, he does the whole shebang, is, is Peter Jackson. And I'll, and I'll tell you why. For me, Peter Jackson nails two things, which is scale and story. The perfect example of that, there's a scene in The Fellowship of the Ring, and it's this unbelievable vista shot of these tiny specks moving along, and you go, oh my God, look at that. And it goes from that to a shot of Gandalf's eyes here. And you go, there is a clever guy, because that's drama. It's going from, this is the setting, this is the picture I'm giving you, but actually what's important is what's going on here. And Peter Jackson for me is, is in some ways the mecca. I just, I think that that man is, is an unbelievable filmmaker, but, but more importantly, an unbelievable storyteller. Of course, people like Quentin Tarantino, I mean, who isn't inspired by Quentin Tarantino? His dialogue, I just think, is, is out of this world. Frank Darabont, I think, is, is exceptional. And because, for me, the thing that I connect with with Frank Darabont is, is the child in him. Watching him behind the scenes on, I mean, one of my favourite films is The Mist. God, I just think it's, it's one of the scariest films I've ever seen. Not because there's monsters, but because of, of society and, and technically the film is really about what happens to society when you apply fear and pressure and Darabont just fucking nailed it. He's just exceptional and it, like I said it's the child in him that I connect with and the fact that you can tell that the sets he's on he's having fun and at the same time he's getting really good work and sometimes that's really hard to achieve where you have to be dedicated and focused and you've got all these people around you that you need to make sure are happy and more importantly as well know what they're doing and at the same time having fun, that's, I mean, but again, man, there's loads. Joss Whedon um, is another one. He's just amazing. Gareth Edwards, I think for me, is in some ways an inspiration that, that it kind of hits closer to home, I guess, in the sense that he, he had a five year career of doing visual effects, but at the same time knew he wanted to make movies. And the thing that gave him, I guess, the leg up and, and the step up into the industry and to do the thing he wanted to do was the fact that he could direct and at the same time do his own visual effects. And I like to believe that as my career continues, the thing that allows me to also have a, have a foot up is the fact that I can, I can do that as I, I feel like I know how to direct a scene and I know what I want, but at the same time, I can also run as my own visual effects supervisor. And I recommend if anybody else is interested in visual effects, and you can acquire both of those skills. It's an unbelievable thing to be able to do. But Gareth Edwards for me has just proven that if you've got an idea and you are clever about it, you can almost achieve anything with today's technology. The computers we can go buy now in PC world are more powerful than the computers they create Jurassic Park on. And it's so true. And I think, I mean, obviously Monsters, his film just is, is absolute proof of that and I think he is kind of the first of many I like to think filmmakers who who break into Hollywood by breaking down the barriers of you know five ten years ago Hollywood owned big action movies and monster movies but now all of a sudden because of 
advances in technology and what we can do with home computers. They don't anymore. We can, you know, I can go out and put a gigantic lightning storm in the sky. You don't have to hire an entire, um, you know, post team to go and do that. One guy can sit down and go, okay, yeah. And I think he's the first of many of where, I mean, what, what um, George Lucas said um, just after he finished Star Wars, which he said the future of filmmaking is, is kids with cameras because the technology is going to, going to become available for us to be able to go and make films, and it is. And he is proof that literally you can go out and make a film worthy of the cinema, a great story, great visuals, and, and, and it got in Godzilla. So <laughs> he obviously done something right. But Gareth Edwards is, is very, very important to filmmakers kind of such as myself and um, about where we're going, where the industry's going and where, where no budget filmmaking is going as well. A good friend of mine is a man named Peter Pedrero and he's a stunt coordinator. And he, uh, he's been in the industry for many, many years, 20, 25 years. And his first job was Braveheart. He was a, a stunt performer. And he discovered my work when I was about 14, 15. And he was on the set of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, part two. And I, at the time, had just made a visual effects test to recreate the scene between Dumbledore and Voldemort uh, in Order of the Phoenix. So there's me and my friend Sam, who plays Kipper, um, which is insane because it doesn't look like him, uh, dueling with wands, and, and people loved it. And Peter Pedrero, while on the set of Harry Potter, saw it. He was doing some research for wand duels and came across it. And he contacted me immediately saying, holy shit. I thought it was the visual effects boys on this film pissing about, and then I discovered you're a teenager. <laughs> we need to meet. And I didn't contact him for about two months. And he said, it's a shame you, you didn't get in touch sooner because I could, I could have got you a job on, on Harry Potter. I could have got you in as an extra, as a, as a student at the Battle of Hogwarts, which you can imagine destroyed me. <laughs> but he is, for me, one of the most, if not the most, professional human being I've ever met. Uh, and he's worked on thousands of gigantic sets. I mean, since then, I mean, that was 2009, 2010. I've worked with him, I mean, many times on, on I mean, we, we worked on a film a couple of years ago called Jab Taka Hajan, which is a Bollywood film, but the budget was like 7.5 million. And it, it gives you an idea. What I think what the point I'm trying to get to is he gave me a route into the industry in the sense that this is what it can be like take in as much as you can and learn as much as you can. Um, and without that, I mean, that amount of momentum, learning from him, the way he coordinated people, the way he, I mean, I, I, some of the biggest praise I've, I've ever got so far, especially for my YouTube videos, is how the hell do you go about choreographing and executing your fight scenes and your sequences? And I can tell you now, it's because of Peter Pedrero, because of the way I watch him work and the way he stages things and what looks great for the camera, but at the same time is safe, tricks, I mean, I mean you name it. And that's, what, I mean, again, great section of Hungerford is when we have a fight with, with the postman and we do it all in one take and there's a, there's a knife and he gets stabbed and it sticks in and he twists the knife and pulls it out, gets his face sprayed and it burns off and it's all in one take. And the truth is it's learning from what I believe to be one of the best undiscovered filmmakers out there, which is Peter Pedrero. The man is and has been for a long time one of my biggest sources of inspiration. And certainly, I mean, the first time I ever met him was at Pinewood Studios. He said, we're shooting an, uh, 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 trailer, a test trailer for a film, all in 3D, we're going to have a rain machine, we're shooting it at a thousand frames per second, come along because I want you to see this and I, I want to obviously meet you and so I did and it was just, I mean it was backbreakingly hard because it was just like mid-February and a, on a night shoot and rain tower and it was fucking abysmal but the inspiration it gave me, we were on the Baker Street back lot, it was just like, so this is the world that I want to be in and that I'm, I want to aim towards and I feel every year I'm getting closer and closer and closer to it. So I, I know I can't thank the man enough. And there's, you know, there's other, I mean, like I said, Robert Rodriguez, a mate, I mean, unbelievable catalyst to you can make films on no money. <laughs> Don't let anybody ever tell you differently. You can do it. Adam Brown, 
who plays Ori the Dwarf in The Hobbit, which is, an in, I mean, is insane. He comes from Hungerford. People know him around town, and this is a, a town of 4,000 people, and he's just been cast as one of the leads in The Hobbit. That, to me, a few years ago, gave me an amazing amount of momentum, because it was like, well, if he's just done it, fuck it. I mean, I definitely need to go do it. This is the great thing about Wild Seed Studios. So the company that I work with to develop this and to, to shoot it are a talent incubation company who basically spot talent and believe in giving them an opportunity. They, they give you a budget of $10,000, uh, pounds rather, <laughs> $10,000 pounds to go and make what you want to go and make. Hungerford got bumped up to, I think, 20, between 20 and 25,000 because we kind of realised halfway through it was like, okay, if we want to actually do this, I'm not even going to say it properly, but we were like, okay, let's, let's just shove some money into some places where we really need it to go. But things like insurance and catering, um, they had covered, which was, which was great. They were like, Drew, you're, you know, you're the filmmaker, you go make the film. All of the legal stuff and all of the little things that you don't need to be worrying about or that's pestering you in the back of the head, we'll take, it. We'll take care of that, which was fantastic because it allowed me as, as the creative to com completely focus in on the thing that I wanted to make the thing that I wanted to shoot and the story that I wanted to tell. So we shot it on a Canon C300, which is a funny story behind that, which is I, I'd never used one ever. And we picked one up the day before the shoot and our, my producer, Jesse, gave it to me and he basically said, you've got 24 hours, learn how to use it. <laughs> so I was running around Hungerford High Street with it, just trying, okay, so what does that button do? Oh shit, fuck. Fantastic camera to shoot on, I recommend it to anybody. I cut, again, another funny story is, is before Hungerford, I cut everything on Sony Vegas. And I said to the two producers, Jesse and Miles, I said, I can cut this film on, <laughs> on Sony Vegas. And they went, mm, we'd prefer if you cut on Premiere. And I said, okay, so I, I learnt Premiere for the film while I was cutting the film. I had to try and also learn how to cut in a completely um, alien, alien piece of kit. And all the visual effects were done in Adobe After Effects and I'm hoping with the sequel I take that to the next step further and there's a few more other programs that I'd like to learn, 3D modelling for instance. I mean, what you use at the end of the day doesn't matter. If you've got an iPhone 4 and you know, um, iMovie on a Mac, you can shoot and cut a film. You know, the technology we have available to us now is just unbelievable. And, you know, whether you're starting out or whether you've been in the industry for, you know, 20, 50, whatever years. I mean, I saw a, a, a picture the other day of Robert Rodriguez using a, a 5D. And it's, it's just beautiful to know that the big guns, the people that we're all striving to be like and to create movies like, are using the same tech as us. I just think that's amazing. The lines are continuously becoming more and more blurred. Um, and I think that gives a lot of filmmakers, you know, for the future, a lot of hope. Tom Scarlett, who plays Adam Martell, is my cousin. Um, I've been making videos and films of him for the past, what, four, almost five years now. Uh, and we grew up together, we played Lord of the Rings together. And it was weird, in 2010 he contacted me and said, God, I mean, dude, I love what you're doing, C can I get involved? You know what I'm like, I just want to have some fun. And yeah, here we are now, you know, kind of almost ten videos down the line in a movie. It's just insane. And Sam Carter, who plays Kipper, is my best friend. Georgia Bradley, who plays Philippa, um, Adam's sister. We put out an open casting call to any local people interested in, in being in the film, whether it was an extra or helping out or being in it. And she grabbed us immediately. And it's funny because originally Phil was going to be a guy. Um, it was going to be four guys in the flat until Georgia came along, who was actually cast as Janine, which is Cohen, my character's love interest. And we said, oh, we're not, we're not utilising Georgia enough. Why don't we make her Adam's sister? Because my friend Josh, who was going to play Phil, dropped out, unfortunately. So we needed to fill, fill, fill shoes. And then it, was, it just it snapped into our heads. It was like, oh my God, we call her Phil because she's one of the guys. But her name's Philippa. So it's a fun, there's a funny story around that. In Hungerford is a weird one for me because we shot all of it in Sam Carter's flat. That flat, you know, we, we didn't rent it. We, that was, he owned it. And I lived there for almost six months. So there's a, there's a strange piece of Hungerford that kind of is, is very deep in my heart because it's so close to my life and to our life. And I think in a weird way, we deliberately wanted to do that because it, it felt 
realer, I guess, if, that, if that's a word. Um, it felt more authentic. It's, it can be sometimes, oh, I mean, not even sometimes, it's often very hard to create real drama and, and, and a real dynamic relationship with people. <clears throat> well, I'd be lying to say that I wasn't intimidated. <laughs> Uh, but intimidation is, I believe, I think it's, it's healthy uh, because it makes it real. And I think, I think the best, one of the best pieces of advice I've ever heard about filmmaking, and I uh, know I've heard a lot, was from David Fincher. He said, when an artist is painting on a piece of canvas, he said, the artist doesn't just try and do everything at once. He said, the artist takes it one paint at a time, one brush at a time figuring the next piece out as he goes along. And that to me was, was one of the best pieces, like I said, of, of advice, because that's how I believe, especially if you're on a long shoot, especially if you're trying to make something that's, you know, that is quite long, but, but it also applies to any kind of, of filmmaking, is take, take it one shot at a time, one piece of dialogue at a time, one scene at a time. And then all of a sudden you realize that this thing is, has grown up and built and it's oh my god we've got quite a lot of stuff here and if you're putting your focus and your in, uh, and, and your attention into each individual thing that's how I believe you you approach something like this um, and not just this like I said anything when you're making a film don't try and make the the whole thing in one go because I don't believe it works like that you need to you need to spend the time to focus in on one thing at a time from day one, when we, when we were having creative conversations before it was even like we knew who the characters were or their relationships, it was, I again was trying to approach it, okay, so we're shooting this fan footage. Now what that means to me is making everything as real as possible, even to the point of where it's, it's hard to describe, where it's not cinematic, but it just feels like a moment in everyday life. So what we'd done, which is an interesting, it was an interesting approach and I believe it worked, was we, we wrote up, over the, over the course of kind of eight months, a 60-page story document. For every scene, we knew where each character came into the scene and left the scene, uh, what the conflict and the struggle was within the scene. And then we went, uh, we basically went and rented a rehearsal studio for two weeks, and we just hammered out the scenes. Learning from it, um, creating dialogue, creating, you know, reaction and effect, and and learning organically. There wasn't like a, a set structure to how everything should be. It was like, okay, so this is the scene. Cohen, you're like this, and you're gonna come out of it like this, but remember, you need to get that piece of information across. Phil, I don't know. And then what was great is we would, Jesse and I would work with the actors as well, as, and obviously me being a director and, the act, and, a, and a fellow actor. And we were open and willing enough to listen to what their input would be. As a director, I wasn't like, you are like this, you are like this. It was like, okay, Tom, talk to me about Adam. Where do you think he's gonna come in with this? Would he react like that? Or do you think he should take it completely differently? And we organically, I think that's the best way I can describe it. We, all, we organically created the scenes, I guess. And then what was great is I also, I allowed for some time on, on set when we were filming for some improv time. Because I said, I said from day one, I said, it, it's great if we can get some moments that aren't scripted, that aren't planned, and that while we're all, we are all in character, we're on set, let's just shoot. I'd prefer to overshoot than undershoot. And actually some of the, some of the finished film were moments that, that off the top of our heads we came up with. All the party scene, that was, there wasn't even supposed to be a party scene, it was a completely different scene. And we were like, because they were actually all supposed to go out, go out and get a kebab. And we were like, maybe they should have a little piss up. So for, for 20 minutes, I mean, I think it was even longer, half an hour to an hour, we just kept shooting. Loads of different moments. Cohen coming in with a guitar in his dressing gown, singing and serenading. And again, it was like, we had all this footage. It's like, okay, so what do we like? What, what works? What kind of gets the point? And I, I, again, it makes it more organic and it was natural. It wasn't trying to hit precise moments. And I think for a found footage movie, I think it was a really clever, clever decision to, to be made. With Hungerford, I mean, again, and I believe it's, it's how you should approach any film, and especially the sequences, is there were conscious decisions I, I, I like to think I made from day one, or certainly while we were even writing it, about, for instance, so with a found footage movie, I really wanted to make sure we incorporated the camera as much as we could. I didn't want the audience to feel like observers. I wanted the audience to feel like they were part of the action and they were part of the scenario and part of the story. 
for instance, I love it because there was a, I mean, there's been a couple of reviews in the past few months that have, 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 have picked up on it. And I, you know, that's an amazing feeling when somebody has picked up on conscious decisions. For instance, um, like when the bug is revealed for the first time, it, it pounces off the back of Adam's head and it, it scuttles across the floor. And I deliberately wanted it to crawl up the, the table and over the camera because then all of a sudden the audience aren't just sat there watching it. It's in their face. And you're, you're there with the characters in that situation going, fucking hell, what was that? Exactly what the, the characters are thinking. So from a story you know, perspective, that, that works. As well, for instance, um, when the group are escaping from Janine's house and one of the bogged up zombies runs into the camera and the blood sprays up under the camera and you, you come down with Kipper and it's almost from a POV. That again, just makes the scenario so much more engaging rather than just watching something like the eye of God, you're kind of like, okay, well, that's dramatic. But because we didn't have the luxury of cutting between putting the camera here, then putting the camera wide and then pushing the camera mid, it was about trying to have a dynamic shot where you'd done that in one flow instead of cutting because, because it was found footage, you can cut, but to cut from a wide to a, you know, <laughs> to a close, it, it doesn't work like that. I said, obviously, because I mean, I, I like to think I have a few people who are, who are willing to watch my stuff. And I said, well, of course, because it's my film as well, I'm going to push it. It doesn't matter what you say or do. I'm going to I'm going to help promote it because unfortunately, we're not in a position where we can chuck 100 grand solely into marketing it. So for them, it was about pushing it to all the people they know. And we got a PR company called um, Hot Cherry, helped push the film to a lot of places, uh, places like Bloody Disgusting to get a review and so on and so forth. So it was a joint effort, really, to, to, to push it as far as we can. And it's still, this is what's interesting about, about independent films, is if you've got a great film and somebody, you know, believes in it enough to push it further, it can happen very quickly. But what you'll usually find is it will be what we like to call a slow burn. So, I mean, we finished Hungerford in April this year. And since then, it's been a very slow burn and it would kind of spike where we'd have a screening or a premiere. And then there'd be a couple of rumblings, the odd review. And I believe that'll be the case now for at least the next year. I, I mean, there's, there's film festivals already next year that, that we've got into. So I think, and it was weird for us because I know like Tom who plays Adam, my, my cousin, he, he was almost expecting it to come out. And it was like, oh my God, we've got a distribution deal in a week. And I was like, it doesn't, as far as I'm aware, it doesn't happen like that. You have to be patient and you have to let it almost simmer. And that's what I'm, I'm finding right now. You have to choose when you're on set. Are you, are you visual effects supervisor first or director second? Or are you director first and visual effects supervisor second? And the answer is simple, you're director first. And it's all about capturing the shots that tell your story. And the visual effects comes afterwards. You shouldn't even be worrying about that. And again, that's the job of, the, of a visual effects supervisor to tell you how to do it and where and why. So for instance, the shot of the storm, the big reveal that I knew in my head from day one, I was like, oh my God, I can just see this and it's gonna look awesome. And it was very close to how I even imagined it, in some ways better. I wasn't thinking on the day, I, I could actually shoot that like that to make it easier. It was about in the moment, in the story, with the characters, how do we need to see this? And it needs to be as visually impactful, if that's a word, as the, as the characters would see it. So while I was shooting, I remember I, I got the, the, the blank plate of, of us running out and we had the extras on the street and we had just a beautiful blue sky and everybody's looking up going, oh my God. And then I remember cut, oh my God, that looks amazing. And then looking at it thinking, fuck, that's gonna be a job and a half. Um, but, that's, but that's what you do is, you know, you put the story forward. And I, I recommend, and you can tell, you can tell when somebody is made, and I, you know, I'm a victim to it, but I, I've done it where you, you build a scene or a story around the visual effects, or you build it around the, the character and the story, what it should be about, and the visual effects enhance the story. And that's really the purpose of visual effects. Otherwise, it's just a showreel. <laughs> So we are currently at the moment in pre-production for Hunger for Two. We want to kind of go and do it again, but better, bigger, tighter. And again, I mean, we left the first one on such a cliffhanger. We thought, let's go make it because we want to know what happens next. And, and not, I mean, there's been quite a few people who have said, we want to know what happens next. So I'm currently uh, in the process of just finishing off the story with, with Wild Seed Studios. I've just recently begun preparing my own short film, which I'm really excited about, which is 
all set in space, which is going to be awesome because I love space. The director and uh, filmmaker Noel Clark, I met with him earlier this year and he sounded quite excited about potentially doing a project. Whether anything happens, who knows? So it's, it's all good. I really do genuinely feel like I'm taking several leaps, not steps, but leaps in the right direction. And all the while, you know, uh, perfecting and, and learning, constant, constant learning. I can't tell you how much I've learned in the past year and a half, two years. Making something on this size, working with, with new people and old people, you know, running a set. I mean, we were shooting five, six scenes a day. We would shoot like one take and they just trusted me to know that I'd got what I, what I wanted and what I, ne what I needed. So, uh, no, I'm very excited, genuinely. I think 2015 is going to be insane. Yeah, <laughs> it's quite a few things. There is a whole world of filmmakers out there that you can tap into now, which is just unbelievable. Go shoot it.